Okay, hematological cancers. There's a reason they call it heme onc for a reason. There's a lot of cancers involved in the blood vessels. Um, it's an 18-page PowerPoint. Don't let the shortness um, dissuade you. There's a lot of info here in these 18 slides. Um, what I'm going to do is try and a very bit, and again, guys, we could have a whole entire semester class on just these hemoc cancers here. Um, please, I'm giving you a very basic, basic overview of these cancers to try and help keep them separated in your mind. Um, and the key treatments here are going to be that all these cancers are treated with chemotherapy. And so a lot of the focus and the interventions on here are going to be chemotherapy, expected versus unexpected side effects. But let's, so we're going to go through and talk about five different kinds of um, bone marrow cancerous disorders here. We have leukemia and lymphoma, so we'll try and get those separated in your head. Leukemia is a cancer of the bone marrow. Lymphomas are a cancer of the lymph nodes. That makes sense. Multiple myeloma is an actual cancer of your blood plasma cells um, that does infiltrate into our bone marrow, but it doesn't originate in our bone marrow. Um, polycythemia vera is actually bone marrow overproduction, um, and aplastic anemia is the stem cells being destroyed in the bone marrow. So we're going to go through each one of these um, five cancers, and then we'll talk about chemotherapy and its expected and unexpected side effects. Um, so all I'm going to need you to do is recognize these and kind of know the, um, the originations of all of these. Um, again, the bone marrow is our blood cell factory. There are stem cells in our bone marrow that then are programmed to divide into either red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets. Um, so let's look at the first one. There are two kinds of leukemia. There's a myeloid and a um, lymphotic. So there's two kinds of leukemias. The word leukemia means the cancer is originating in the bone marrow. Okay, It is a cancer of these specific cells called myeloblasts. So not a cancer of the actual stem cells. It's after the stem cell has decided it's a myeloid, and then it gets divided into different things. It gets different jobs assigned to it from there. So this one ends up becoming cancerous, and any myeloblast becomes, um, it's coded wrong, and it becomes cancerous. And a cancerous um, cell is basically useless and um, crowds out space doesn't become what it's supposed to do, doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So this cancer of the myeloblast means that um, now we have all these big myeloblasts hanging out in the bone marrow, but they're not making what they're supposed to be making, which is three of our different kinds of white blood cells. So we have giant myeloblasts that take up room in our bone marrow and are basically hanging out on our dollar and not doing what it's supposed to be doing. So these myeloblasts are cancerous now. They're useless to us, um, and all they do is take up space. They're not turning into um, the eosinophils, basophils, and neutrophils that we need them to turn into. You have plenty of, you have no problem making red blood cells. You have no problem making platelets until these myeloblasts take over everything and basically steal the room from making your proper cells. So eventually over time, and those are our worsening cues, is these myeloblasts take over and um, crowd out our red blood cell platelet and lymphoblast, and lymphoblast formation. So eventually your whole entire bone marrow is full of these big, stupid, useless myeloblasts that don't do anything. They're not creating anything. They're just taking up space. So it's like, you know, a mom's basement full of useless children that don't do anything. And um, that is kind of very simple cartoon definition of leukemia. But if this whole space is... Um, is taken up by myeloblasts, then the factory can't produce the things it needs to produce, and it eventually ends up not making anything. The bone marrow is full of junk. Um, 
So what we're going to see on these patients is, first of all, what you're going to see is just frequent infections because these guys, if you look back at the first one, were our first line of defense in um, killing infectors before they come in. The B lymphocytes, the T lymphocytes are involved in cell immunity and specific um, attacks on specific um, uh, organisms, but the eosinophil, the basophil, and the neutrophil, they're always cleaning up our body. They're, they're their first line of defense, and we've lost our first line of defense. So the overall white blood cell count drops because we're not making three-fifths of our um, normal blood cells, so our white blood cell count will drop, and then when they go into the differential, which tells you the percentages of all the different kinds of white blood cells, we'll see that the eosinophil, the basophil, and the neutrophil are very, very small, if they're being made really at all. Um, the myeloblast isn't making anything, so we have plenty of uh, lymphocytes, but none of the other white blood cells. So the overall white blood cell count is low, and then on the differential, we're missing um, the eosinophils, the basophils, and the neutrophils. Frequent infections is usually our first cue um, because we don't have our first line of defense. So then as these myeloblasts start taking over, so they cut out the production of these, but we're still making red blood cells and platelets, and we're still making lymphocytes. But then as the myeloblasts start replicating themselves, because big useless cancer cells, that's what they do. They create this big tumor, this bone marrow full of myoblasts, and now we don't have room to make the rest of our cells in our bone marrow. So we still continue. Now we've lost our, um, as things get worse into this, we've lost our lymphocytes, causing more frequent infections because there's no lymphocytes. Um, so now your white blood cell count drops to hardly anything because there's hardly any white blood cells being made. Um, you end up with hypoxia and anemias because you are not making your red blood cells. There's no room to make it. You end up with low platelet count because there's no room for... Um, so you end up with um, thrombocytopenias because there's no room to make platelets. So uh, it's the worsening cue of this, and sometimes people don't even notice. Maybe they just think, oh, I'm kind of sickly, uh, not paying attention, not feeling well all the time. But now all of a sudden you end up with some microbleeds or you end up with some bruising that you don't know how to explain. And that's because those myeloblasts have taken over the bone marrow and have crowded out your red blood cell and platelet production. So that is a worsening cue of leukemias. It's very um, hard to spot in its early stage. When it's in its later stage or its worsening stage, um, you end up with anemias and thrombocytopenias as well. Unfortunately, these myeloblasts don't just stay in the bone marrow. Bone marrow is very vascular, um, and they get out, and they metastasize to other organs as well, and the liver and the spleen are the most common. Once those myeloblasts are in there infecting the liver or the spleen, they start crowding out um, liver function, and you can end up in renal failure, or liver failure, sorry. So um, myeloid leukemia is a cancer of the bone marrow of the myeloblast cells, and what they are going to see is um, just an overall low white blood cell count with low eosinophils, basophils, and neutrophils in the differential. So let's go and talk about our other leukemia, another problem with the bone marrow. But now instead of the myeloblast being the problem, this is the lymphoblast being the problem. This is our big useless cell. So our cell-mediated immunity or our specific immunity is now no longer existing. Our second line of defense is gone. We still got a couple of first-line defenders left, um, but this still happens. So we're going to have a low white blood cell count because all of these guys are not being made anymore. We're still making three kinds, but what we're going to see is when they look in the differential, that one kind, the lymphocytes are low and the other sides are still being produced. But then as this gets worse, again, these giant lymphoblasts kind of take over the whole thing and then eventually crowd out our production of the rest of our white blood cells, our platelets, and our red blood cells. So um, again, very similar presentations. Really the only way to um, tell the difference is really on your differential, seeing um, 
they'll do a bone marrow biopsy. They'll pull all these troublesome cells out of there, see if the lymphoblasts or the myeloblasts are at the root cause. Um, so I don't want you to spend too much time um, worrying about which ones start which ones or how are you going to recognize it because the presentation for lymphocytic and um, myeloid leukemias are very similar and that you have frequent infections, you're not feeling that great, um, your white blood cell count is low, and then most people don't present until they start seeing um, shortness of breath, anemias, or microbleeds, which is a sign of basically a worsening cue that these lymphoblasts or myeloblasts, whichever one is cancerous, have taken over the bone marrow and have reduced our production of red blood cells, platelets, and the rest of our white blood cells. Um, Lymphocytic leukemia loves to get into the CSF and the spine and the brain. So they do have different metastasis points, but again, I'm not going to make you memorize all that. Um, I really just wanted to point out that the leukemias are in the bone marrow, and when the bone marrow factory gets compromised, we end up not producing red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, even though it's just a disorder of the precursors to white blood cells. Leukemia is a disorder of a precursor to white blood cells, um, but it does affect our red blood cells and platelets because they crowd out the factory. Um, lymphomas are now, we've, the factory is working just fine. Um, these are, the lymphocytes go to live, they get created in the bone marrow, but then they go off to school in the thymus gland or in the lymph system. So they go to learn their specific immunity, um, and that's why they're called T lymphocytes. The T lymphocytes um, g have come from the thymus. So they're made in the bone marrow, but then they go to school in the thymus, so they get the name T lymphocytes. They carry their alumni with them everywhere. The thymus gland is where um, immunity is taught to these lymphocytes, and now they are learned what a flu bug looks like, and they go out on the prowl for flu bugs. Um, they know what the chicken pox looks like, and they're on the prowl for chicken pox. These T lymphocytes have their own specific um, thing that they're out there and they're programmed to destroy, and they learn that in the thymus. Um, the B lymphocytes are the ones that create antibodies. Um, so, I mean, again, I'm not going to test you on this, but I think it's my kids will laugh at me, but I think it's fascinating. The B lymphocytes um, get released from the bone marrow and circulate around, and they get exposed to things and create um, the antibodies and then go share them with the thymus, and then they teach um, T lymphocytes how to become specific immunity. Anyway, lymphocytes are um, create, they are in charge of our antibodies and our um, cell-specific um, immunity. So they kind of go off to school. They leave the bone marrow, and they go off and they learn new things. The B cells are learning about antibodies. The T cells are learning about specific um, viruses and infections and bacteria and how to kill them. Um, and they kind of circulate, and they live in our lymph nodes because our lymph nodes is the giant, giant um, garbage facility of our body. So whenever um, we do a big cleanup process, um, all that gets dumped into the lymph node. The lymph nodes drain down into your intestines and into your liver to kind of clean things up. Um, but the lymph node is kind of like a, a sewer system for our body. The lymph nodes are where um, basically all these cells, um, when the white blood cells are working and the immune system is working, um, that's where they go and do their work. Um, they pull the bacteria or whatever out of circulation and they destroy it in the lymph system and then all that stuff goes into the lymph system to get um, either put to the intestines to get waste products or go to the liver to recycle what you can. Um, but the lymph system kind of dumps out into the liver, into the intestines um, because it's a, it's a sewer system. It's where we process um, all the white blood cells are doing their work. Um, so when you get these white blood cells... Um, getting kind of crazy, um, they're going to be in the lymph nodes, that's their work environment, um, and that's where they go crazy, is in the lymph system. So um, the um, Hodgkin's lymphoma and Nodge Hodgkin's, so both of them are called lymphoma, both of them have Hodgkin's in the name, because of course they just want to ruin student nurses' lives. 
Um, Hodgkin's lymphoma was found by Dr. Hodgkin, um, and they found that Hodgkin's lymphoma is associated with infection with the Epstein-Barr virus. So you get this virus, and this virus signals these lymphocytes to grow and divide rapidly, producing something called a Reed-Steinberg cell. Um, it's a not very nice lymphocyte. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It kind of roams around and just causes trouble. Um, but it's very easily treatable, um, and you can get rid of them pretty easily with um, a round of chemotherapy. Um, we'll kill these Reed-Steinberg cells. Um, so Hodgkin's is associated with a virus, and it produces Reed-Steinberg cells. Non-Hodgkin's is um, basically where old lymphocytes they don't die, they just keep growing and dividing. Um, so big old men just kind of chilling out there. You get an oversupply of lymphocytes in your lymph nodes. They get swollen, um, but it is not associated with a virus. It's not a one specific kind of cell that is dividing. It's just old lymphocytes that are they're useless to any um, malignant cell is no longer doing its function. So it's not like you're making extra lymphocytes. Um, remember, all of our blood cells are programmed for a certain lifespan. Well, these have somehow drinking from the cup of immortality, and these lymphocytes don't die like they should, but they hang around and cause problems. They're not actually doing their job. They're just sitting around. Some people would call them maybe pensioners sitting around on the benches, yammering around, but they're not really doing any work, and they just cause a lot of swelling. Um, they don't really um, mutate, or the problem they have mm. is when they um, metastasize to another place and start conglomerating in there and affecting your workload. Um, but anyway, basically, if they get into, if these lymphoma cells um, get into your liver or your kidney, then they kind of proliferate in there and um, interfere with the work of the organ that they're in. Um, but you can have painless swollen lymph nodes. They're very easily recognizable because all of a sudden you'll have a swollen soft lymph node. Um, they're usually in the neck, armpits, or groin. Um, you can get abdominal pain or swelling because all the lymph nodes do um, dump into our intestinal system. Fatigue, fever, and night sweats, and unexplained weight loss. Again, um, just specific symptoms for lymphoma, but really the biggest sign and symptom is going to be the swollen lymph nodes. There's no pain with it, um, and they are treated with a round of chemotherapy, a round of radiation, takes care of those those old pensioner cells, and then they we move on about our lives. They're both pretty easily um, treated, both of these lymphomas. Um, and again, this is so basic, so basic. I could say so much more. Um, I haven't even learned all that much more about them. But um, those are lymphomas and leukemia. So leukemia is in the bone marrow, crowds out the job of the bone marrow. Lymphomas just kind of swell in the lymph nodes and hang out there and don't do their job of cleaning things up the way they're supposed to, cause blockages of our lymph system. Um, multiple myeloma is a cancer of the plasma blood cells. It has a special little thing called a Ben Jones protein. Um, but these plasma blood cells are in the bone marrow and in circulation. And these masses, um, these multiple myelomas, they get into the bones and they cause severe, severe bone pain. So the lymphomas kind of stay in the lymph system. Um, the leukemias stay in the bone marrow, so you don't have noticeable tumors anywhere. They're in the bone marrow, and they just affect the bone marrow and the factory production there. Um, these myelomas, they travel around because they're in the plasma, and these Ben Jones proteins get into um, the bones and cause um, bone pain, so it's kind of... Um, kind of a bone cancer because it gets in there and um, causes um, bone breakdown is what they do. So they do two things. They cause bone breakdown, these plasma blood cells. They get into the bone marrow and into the bones themselves and cause bone breakdown. They also impair antibody production because your plasma is carrying around um, uh, the B lymphocytes and these plasma blood cells impair antibody production and immune function. Um, but the big, big thing is the bone pain. It gets in these, um, these plasma cells get into your bones, cause a lot of bone breakdown. So you start leaching out calcium, severe, severe um, joint and long bone pain. And then um, they actually cause the red blood cells to stick together. Because remember, this is your plasma. Everything's just floating around. Um, 
happy-go-lucky in the blood vessels together here. But these Ben Jones proteins cause these the red blood cells to stick together in stacks. The red blood cells work just fine, except they can't get loose to actually work. So um, your red blood cell, your useful red blood cell, actually goes down. And um, they think they, you have an anemia, but then when they go to look at the red blood cells under the microscope, they don't see macrocytic or microcytic red blood cells. They see normal red blood cells in stacks. It's called a rouleau formation. Um, and that is the Ben Jones protein and the rouleau formation are two cardinal signs of a multiple myeloma. But this is a cancer of plasma blood cells. So you can imagine how easy it is for plasma cells to get around the body and um, get into trouble. So um, the first signs are bone pain. Then when you go in and get lab work, you have low white blood cells, um, again, because of the impaired antibody production. Um, and then your red blood cells get all kind of stucky and stacked together. Red blood cells are supposed to bounce around off of each other and stay circular. Um, they're not getting sickled. There's no actual problem with the hemoglobin. Um, but you end up with anemia because they're all kind of traveling down together in like a little stack. Um, and they're not they're not releasing oxygen the way they are supposed to. Um, so you do end up with signs of an 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 ugh, anemia, um, and you have increased calcium level, and they can find this Ben Jones protein in your urine. Um, the body will excrete it. Um, so basically, if you see this Ben Jones protein, um, it's associated with multiple myeloma. Um, because of the heavy bone involvement, um, there's multiple fractures and bone pain, severely painful um, cancer, but it's a cancer of your um, plasma blood cells. So polythemia vera is a bone marrow stem cell cancer, but now, so if we drew a picture, oh, I should go back, I should have drawn my picture of my bone, my stem cells. Um, in polythemia vera, these guys are overproducing the stem cell. Oops, let me go back. So in cells grow, and um, they make a ton of extra things. They can divide into anything. We have an overproduction. So basically, we have more stem cells, which break into more things. So it's an overproduction of red mm -hmm. blood cells, platelets, and white blood cells. And you're like, hey, that's amazing, right? Um, that's amazing to have so many. We get so many red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Um, the only problem with this is that it makes the blood really viscous. We have too many red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Um, we need a nice balance. We don't want too little, but we don't want too many either. Um, the increased blood cells in this vascular system make the blood really, really thick and viscous and inhibits blood flow. Um, the signs of it are spleen and hepatomegaly because the spleen and the liver are trying to... Um, deal with all of this extra and try to clean some of it out. Um, because of the overproduction of red blood cells, you get a ruddy complexion, reddened skin, intermittent claudication because you've got such sluggish flow around. Um, you get intermittent um, ischemia, not because there's an occlusion or a clot or a block. It's just really sluggish blood flow. Um, so anyway, polycythemia, polycythemia vera is an overproduction of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Um, you're not so much worried about any infections or anemias or thrombocytopenias. We don't have any of those. We just have basically thick blood flow. Um, aplastic anemia is where the stem cells... So here's the picture. I put the picture over here. Um, the stem cells are destroyed by something. Um, and so if the stem cells are destroyed, so is the production of everything. So this is not a, a issue of a cancer that is um, taking everything, you know, that is basically overproducing. It's like empty bone marrow, and the fat cells end up replacing the bone marrow, and so you're not producing red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets. Um, that's the word pancytopenia, um, aplastic anemia. So you're just missing these stem cells. They've gotten destroyed. They've They've been destroyed um, by something. And a lot of times the destroying um, 
the destroying factor is high dose chemotherapy or radiation treatments, unfortunately. Um, things that create toxic chemicals, and then there's some infections that can give you an aplastic anemia. But this is one of the side effects, unfortunately, of chemotherapy is aplastic anemia, and it's due to destruction of the bone stem cells in the bone marrow, and you don't produce red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So it's not a cancer of its own. It's usually environmental um, because we're giving you something that is toxic and kills the stem cells. So now that we have talked about all the different kinds, it's like, what do you do about all of them? Um, most of them are treated with chemotherapy of some kind. Um, unfortunately, aplastic anemia, um, because we've destroyed bone cells, um, we're not going to give that one chemotherapy. Usually it is chemotherapy related. Um, but for the other ones, chemotherapy is a good drug to fix any um, overproductive cell that's useless and not functioning. So to get rid of those myoblasts, um, lymphoblasts, um, Hodgkin's lymphoma cells, um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cells, uh, multiple myeloma cells, chemotherapy is the... Um, the drug that's going to get rid of those. Bone marrow stem cell transplants are usually the only cure for any of these cancers because usually these cancers are from a genetic miscode. And so if we put new stem cells into the bone marrow, bone marrow stem cell transplant usually does fix most of these hematology oncology cancers. It's just that there are not very many bone marrow donors out there or bone marrow. It's hard to match bone marrow stem cells. And so you may see some people sequestering stem cells for possible use for themselves later on if this if you do end up with a hematologic cancer. Um, but putting new stem cells into the bone marrow that are um, not genetically coded wrong or not malcoded um, will produce healthy um, red blood cells. Um, because you have, with most of these, um, a prone to infection, not with polycythemia vera, but with all the other ones, you do have a low white blood cell count. Um, antibiotics, antivirals are appropriate. Um, if you have low red blood cell production, we'll try to do erythropoietin to stimulate whatever functioning bone marrow you do have to produce red blood cells. Um, aggressive hydration to flush out any toxins you may have in your body. And then if you're on chemotherapy, you'll be on chemotherapy precautions. So I do have a thing on chemotherapy, neutropenic, and bleeding precautions um, because that goes with not just these, but on um, bleeding precautions will go with all of your patients. Um, when, then we're going to talk about chemotherapy side effects. Um, polycythemia polycythemia vera, we said that one is the excess blood cells. Um, we're not really going to do chemotherapy on those. We don't want to kill your stem cells. We just kind of want to remove the extra ones that it's making. Um, they'll actually just, um, they'll bleed you. You get phlebotomy, which means where we just take off some extra blood. Your blood's too viscous. We'll just take off those extra blood cells. You go in for periodic phlebotomy. Um, plasmapheresis is also on the table to remove cancerous cells, maybe in conjunction with um, chemotherapy and radiation for um, lymphomas, multiple myelomas, polycemia vera can clear out, uh, that can clear out the extra blood cells as well. Multiple myeloma, it's very appropriate for because it's a plasma cancer, so we would want to remove as much of your plasma as we can and replace it, but as long as one plasma cancer cell still lives, you will you will end up with multiple myeloma again. So plasmapheresis is usually used if they're going to use it in conjunction with chemotherapy for these hematology cancers. Um, do not memorize this slide, but um, it would be good to kind of just uh, recognize your most common, the end, um, the platins, the cysteines, um, the steens. Um, I like um, steins, binds, and platins. Um, anyway, those, if you see those ends, um, those are usually chemotherapy medications. And again, um, there's those omycins, they're anti tumor antibiotics. Um, so, bleomycin is the most common one, but it's in the same family as vancomycin. Um, some of it's some of vancomycin's big brothers are pretty big deals, um, and they can actually um, act as antibiotics against tumors. Um, so, again, 
These are very, very general. I'm not going to test you on chemotherapy medications, but you may see some of these meds just as you cross through your nursing reading. Um, and so I just wanted you to have kind of a little, a little summary of the chemotherapy medications there. Um, if your patient is getting chemotherapy, or if for some reason they have a low white blood cell count, or they have a low platelet count, um, bleeding precautions, um, thrombo so your thrombocytopenic patient will be with bleeding precautions as well. I'm sure you've learned about bleeding precautions somewhere in your history, but in case you have not, bleeding precautions is for anybody with low platelets, whether it's chemotherapy induced, or whether it's thrombocytopenia produced, um, but it's is you have a high bleeding risk. And so when I put bleeding precautions in any of your interventions on your clotting disorders, these are the bleeding precautions. Keep an eye out for new bruising, soft toothbrush for mouth care. We don't want to create the gums um, bleeding because they won't stop. Um, electric razors rather than straight blades, um, avoiding constipation, um, no suppositories, enemas, or rectal thermometers. Again, we don't want any um, anything with bleeding, no aspirin, no products with aspirin, no anticoagulants, um, and avoiding IM injections and IV sticks and procedures if possible. This is not the patient, a thrombocytopenic patient is not the one we want to be shoving a Foley into. Um, anytime you have a risk of bleeding, you have to double think the procedure if you're on thrombocytopenic precautions. Um, neutropenic precautions are just that you have a high infection risk. And um, if you are, it's called neutropenic because they're usually looking at the neutrophils and your neutrophil count is low, um, but it really factors in for any low white blood cell count, especially neutropenia. Um, neutrophils are your first line that really get in there. So if your neutrophils are low, um, your first line uh, immune system is gone. Um, so if you have a high infection risk, always monitoring a temperature and watch for a fever. Um, but if your patient has a low white blood cell count or low neutrophils, you're not going to mount a fever. Um, those are the cells involved in um, screaming out for the immune system to bump up and create a fever. If those cells are missing, there is no cry for a fever, and you can have a full-blown infection without a fever. So a fever in a neutropenic patient is always an emergency because if you have mounted a fever response, you're pretty dang sick and you're pretty dang infected. It's a late late sign. Um, usually fever is our first find, but in a patient with a low white blood cell or a low neutropenia, neutropenia, Pinea, oh, I've been talking too long, uh, low uh, neutrophil count, then a fever is a big, big deal. Um, strict hand washing. Patients should wear a mask to self-protect themselves from all the other people's germs while they're wandering around the hospital. Um, infected staff and visitors should not come away. The neutropenic diet is no raw or uncooked foods because they have not been cleaned enough and you can get um, salmonella very easily. So no fresh or raw foods. Um, no fresh flowers, live plants on oncology units. Don't send flowers. They won't allow them in the room. There's microbes and fungi in the dirt. Um, they don't elect anything in um, that is live plant-wise. Um, coughing, deep breathing to prevent pneumonia and monitoring very closely for signs and symptoms of infection because our first signs of infection are usually an increased white blood cell count and a fever, and we can't do that if you're a neutropenic. So um, you're watching for signs and symptoms of infection because our first telltale signs are now been shut down. So that is a little on neutropenic and thrombocytopenic precautions. Um, chemotherapy precautions. I don't know if you got this in block two. I think it's in the curriculum for block two. I'm not going to test you on this, but I think you need to learn it somewhere along the line. So I'm putting it here. Um, your hematology and endocrine exam has plenty on it for 25 questions, so I'm not putting chemotherapy on it. So you can just Whew, sit back and enjoy the rest of the lecture. You do not need to take notes on this, but it is good to know for your nursing practice. Um, and I have seen that it's not covered yet. So if it has been, just shut off the recording and you're done. If you have not heard anything about chemotherapy precautions, you can continue to listen, but you do not need to take notes. I have plenty to test you on between endocrine 
and the hematological disorders that I don't need to add chemotherapy to it. So this is for your own information. Um, I will let you read through these, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over that because, again, um, a lot of these precautions are to keep you safe from the chemotherapy um, med itself. Um, you're supposed to wear certain gloves, everything that is waste, body waste, or the gloves that you use or the actual medications go into the chemotherapy waste bin. Everything is color-coded yellow. Um, if your patient is getting chemotherapy, um, they are their body fluids are considered chemotherapy or radioactive, um, and so they will, um, and this goes for patients that are having any kind of brachytherapy, which is where you have radioactive um, pellets um, inserted. Um, basically, their waste can, is has chemotherapy in it or some um, reactive medications. So um, the toilet, your waste, your stool, your urine is all considered contaminated. Um, that contaminated um, Fluid can be flushed down the toilet, but it should be flushed twice so that no one else is exposed to the chemotherapy meds. Um, again, flu you know, if the patient is on chemotherapy precautions, there's a lot more um, care involved. I'll let you read through it. And again, I think it's very interesting for practice. Um, you might come back to those chemotherapy precautions if you ever get a patient with chemotherapy. Um, I just want to go over real quick when your patient is getting chemotherapy, expected versus unexpected side effects. Um, the purpose of chemotherapy is to kill rapidly replicating cells. Um, most of those are cancer cells, but unfortunately we have rapidly replicating cells in our body that the chemotherapy does do a number on, mostly in the GI tract and in your skin. Um, and I kind of wrote the reasons why you expect to see it, but the GI tract um, has a lot of rapidly dividing cells in it. Your mucous membrane turns over every few days. Your esophageal lining turns over every three days. Your GI lining, they're always exposed to toxins and they're rapidly turning over. Um, so when we give chemotherapy, we end up destroying our um, GI tract. And so mouth, throat sores, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, a metallic taste, appetite loss, all expected, unfortunately. Um, blood disorders, again, are red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets are constantly being turned over, and um, chemotherapy does lead to aplastic anemia, which is a reduction in all three of them. Um, chemotherapy directly affects nerves, um, so a lot of nerve damage and pain is expected with chemotherapy. Sometimes that nerve damage, unfortunately, is permanent. Um, we have trouble thinking and memory, and of course, hair loss. We all think of hair loss. Hair follicles actually um, divide so rapidly and they grow so rapidly that chemotherapy attacks those follicles um, and kills the follicles. Um, the um, hair loss is um, temporary. As soon as chemotherapy stops, the follicles start producing again. Um, but those are expected side effects. Things that we never expect if your patient is getting chemotherapy is um, basically any kind of organ failure. Um, tumor lysis syndrome is where the tumor cells are killed off and lysed and release all of their bad contents into the bloodstream, but actually clog up the kidneys and lead to acute renal failure. Any fever is an oncology emergency, especially if it's greater than 101. That means that if you've gotten a fever that high, it's because you are so chock full of bacteria that the immune system finally recognized it. It didn't need a signal. It's gotten um, the fever. If the fever response is there, you're very late into an infection. Um, bone breakdown can cause serious hypercalcemia. We do not expect that to happen. Um, we don't expect active bleeding from severe thrombocytopenia, um, spinal cord compression, bowel obstruction, and any extravasation of the chemotherapy can cause problems at your infusion site. You're basically pumping a poison into the body. Um, so I wanted to just kind of review all that. What you do need to know from this lecture is just being able to, um, sorry, I'm just going back through here. Um, going back through here and recognizing the most common um, hematological oncological cancers and how to recognize them. 
um, the treatment that is appropriate for them all is really chemotherapy unless they have specific treatments called out that are appropriate to them. So anything after that um, is going to be just information for you. Um, like I said, the majority of the test is probably going to revolve around the endocrine and the um, anemias and the clotting disorders. Um, maybe one or two questions off of this heme onc slide. So again, don't stress too much and do not um, stress about the chemotherapy precautions um, or the oncology emergencies. I just think those are so important. You do see oncology patients on all units of the hospital. I would like that in the back of your mind, and certainly for NCLEX it is important. So I will leave you with that. I think you've learned enough, um, and let me know again, as usual, if you have any questions or concerns or come across anything in your studies that you don't understand, and send me an email, and I'll try to explain it for you.